Uh. podcast ladies and gentlemen i am michael pivia as always joined by me is Dustin adams well, welcome back to the blue stable podcast we are the official colts podcast of fan sided now what we're gonna do is talk colts we're gonna talk football we're gonna get into some draft stuff with our special guest of course the lovely mustache has returned but what you guys need to do for us real quick smash the like button smash that subscribe button if you have any questions any comments about today's show make sure you leave them down in the comment section on youtube make sure you're listening on apple podcast spotify whatever the case may be guys we enjoy you being here thank you for the support for the continued support and let's get into it our special guest joining us today via math bomb ras king the mustache returns ladies and gentlemen kent lee platty Thanks for having me back, guys. I, I like that you got the twirl going a little better this this, oh, yeah. this this time around. Yeah, I've been beating it into submission, so it'll stay where I want it. <laughs> hey, so sometimes that's what you have to do. But, man, we're super excited to have Kent back. Um, I mean, Kent's back. We're talking draft. Um, it, it's the month of April, guys. Um, it feels like this offseason has taken longer than most. Um, I don't know why that's the case. Maybe it was because Sam Ellinger was the quarterback one for the Colts for too damn long. Um, maybe, maybe that is why it felt like it took 100 years. But uh, I, th- I think the last time Kit was on here, we didn't have a quarterback yet. It might not have been, yeah. I, say, I, don't, I don't think we had gotten Matt Ryan yet. I think maybe Carson Wentz had been traded. I just don't know if – Matt Ryan. Yeah, that's about that's right about now. right for the timeline. I think he had just been traded, and they y'all. Oh, still I think he got traded out. the day after. Or was it after? I think okay. it, was it was right after. around that time. Yeah, that's how that's how our podcasts work, though. We record the <laughs> night this night, and then breaking news happens before we post. Um, so we if that that would make sense, we talk all this stuff about what the Colts could do at quarterback, and then you know they make a move before the podcast is posted. So that would make a lot of sense. That'd be on brand. Um, but hey, there super excited to be back with everybody. Um, I, I want to shout out everybody for uh, last episode breaking the Blue Stables record on YouTube. About two point three thousand views on YouTube. Really appreciate everybody's support this past month. It's really been a really fun off season. Um, so this video better hit two point four k because we didn't have any mustache on the last episode. So that has to add at least two hundred views. And real quick get a before. Good <laughs> right, real quick before we get into any uh, and and like you know what Rashad said last week about my haircut, I came back obviously got edged up and everything. My barber Briscoe hooked me up and everything. But before we get into any football, we really got to get with Kent and, and talk about your secret, man. Well, what is it that you use? What comb do you use? If we have any mustachers that are watching that are Colts fans, what's your secret, man? It's it's really not that hard. You just got to keep combing it and and uh, at, at least a couple times a week, put some oil in it. If, if you forget to do that, it gets all itchy and scratchy. And then you're you're messing around with the whole time and you can't get it to stay how you need to. The rest of it is just is just wax and time. <laughs> it's just taking the time to curl it and, and make it look all pretty. So patience is the key. Patience. You got to look good, too, to start. It does help, though. Once you get it, it, it makes you look even better. <laughs> yeah, those yearly uh, employee photos are never going to, uh, you know, disappoint for you, Mr. Kent. So once again, guys, Kent Lee Platty uh, via Math Bomb is joining the Blue Stable podcast talking draft. Before we get into all that, guys, we got some some exciting, not really exciting, but some questionable news came out uh, via Stephen Holder, via The Athletic. Um, he does great work over there for the Colts, covering them and everything. 
he did put out a tweet out there that kind of ruffled some feathers a little bit in, in, in Colts Nation. So I have it here with me. I'm going to read it. There are a growing number of agents out there who have told me the Colts are being way too stingy on spending. I can't speak to why that is, though some have theories, but regardless of the why, it is what it is at this point. Whoa. Uh, talk about, I mean, it just got cold. I can see my breath already. Dustin, I'll start with you, man. Uh, the Colts are apparently being stingy with the money. Maybe the offers are maybe a little bit lower than maybe what we already think was already low. Maybe Ballard went a little bit lower. What does this mean? And what, what have you heard if you've heard the same thing? And what could this, you know, possibly lead to? Is this a is, is this the start of a serious issue? I mean, Chris Bauer's never been a big uh, home run swinger for in free agency. Um, and I don't I don't blame him. I've been on record in the past saying I don't think free agency has a proven has a proven track record of taking a roster and making it a Super Bowl contender through free agency. I just don't. Um, I think the draft has a better proven track record. I think trades have a better proven track record than free agency even. Um, So I'm not that concerned about it. The problem is this coming from agents. So this is in the agent circles that the Colts are possibly getting a little cheaper. Um, I know for a fact the offers they've made to a couple higher named free agents this offseason were not low offers um i know jarvis landry i know tyron matthew offers that were expanded from the colts were offers that were among the best offers they received um i even heard that for jarvis landry it doubled another offer that he got um it just so it's just really interesting because if it's the the low tier free agents like you just don't want to be known as that like you don't want these c tier free agents to not even want to negotiate with you because agents already know yeah chris bauer is going to offer you way lower than every other team. So that, that's the concern that comes to my mind on it. Ken, do you, do, do you want to add anything uh, pertaining to this at all? I know you're a Lions fan now, but for the Colts, do you have any opinions of this? You know, it's, it's really tough when you don't have a quarterback. And the Colts traded away Carson Wentz. They traded for Matt Ryan. So if you're never able to figure out exactly – what they're going for, right? Whenever you pull in a veteran, are they going to do something like the, the Rams just did with Stafford and try to make a run? Or are they just trying to get somebody who's going to keep them going until they get the next guy? Um, it, as far as the money and stuff, anytime you hear it from the agents, sometimes that's bad because you don't want to hear guys that, that rep people saying, oh, yeah, they're being stingy because those guys are going to bring you the free agents. Free agents don't, don't market themselves because they can't. They're, they're not allowed to. So the agents, the ones that go there, if they know they, that that team has a tendency to offer low money offers, that's not a good reputation to have. Um, but I haven't really seen that much out of the Colts free agent spending because I was just looking that up while you guys were talking about it. Um, that really makes me think that that's too much the case, you know, for, for what the team's going through right now with the quarterback turnover, I'm not sure that they are being too stingy. Yeah. I really wanted Romeo Aquara last year who ended up re-upping with, the Lions, why, I have no idea. Uh, but, hey, it's home for him. It's Detroit making money. And who knows? Maybe things in Detroit are looking up after Derek Stingley gets selected number two overall. So, uh, Destin, real quick before we move on to the newly safety that just got added to the Colts, I'm going to do this on part of the fans, okay? So don't shoot the man- messenger. Do not try to punch me in any sort of way. I'm doing this for the fans. Are there any updates in the Colts free agency news realm? Yeah, I mean, from everything I've heard from my team source, I mean, I know that they've just been kind of waiting on the Matthew and Landry fronts. Um, I know that there have been some other people that they've reached out on to kind of see what the market looks like. Um, I really think they see the draft coming pretty soon i think they know that some of these guys that are not rushing their markets are probably going to still be available after the draft go see how the draft fills these holes see what you have left afterwards there have been plenty of guys signed after the draft that still come in and be productive for their teams the colts even i mean justin houston was a post-draft signing led the colts in sacks 
Um, Eric Fisher started at left tackle. That one wasn't uh, notable for a good reason, but just thought you should we should share that as well. The Colts have had history of going to free agency late in the process. So I don't think it's that big of a concern. We'll see how it plays out. There are some holes that they need to fill for sure. Hey, I tried, guys, and that's the update. Just be patient. The Colts are. Let's try to be as well. Now, we did have a free agent signing this past week, guys. Amani Watts, formerly of Texas A&M, in Kansas City, had one career start, has been sort of a special teamer for them, a, a quality special, special, special teamer for them. Okay, do not laugh at me. Do not make fun of me. Uh, <laughs> a special teamer for the Kansas City Chiefs coming over to the Colts, sort of just filling that George Odom role. I like the fit, especially for Amani, because what was his market looking like? And he sees that there were open spots in the safety room and also on a special teams unit where three of their guys got all pro votes. And Bubba Ventrone is a popular name around the league, maybe for even potential head coaching candidates in the future. Who knows? He was a popular guy on Hard Knocks. I'm sure maybe Amani was watching that. So once again, Amani to the Colts, uh, a depth signing. Will he get any legitimate safety time? Who knows? But for right now, special teams is adding another uh, quality player. Yeah, I mean, I see it as a George Odom replacement in multiple ways. I think he'll he's adding a little depth to the safety room. It's taking over some of those special team snaps. Um, something I want to address even more. Um, fans, are we really – at the point where we're commenting at Armani Watts being upset with him that he's not Tyron Matthew just because the Colts signed a different chief special um, safety. Like this guy had to tweet about it because he said, sorry, I'm not big brother, but I'm not going to deal with any disrespect because fans are jumping in this dude's mentions already. Are we, are we really at that point? Um, it, it is whatever, but like, that's crazy to me, but it's a, it's a depth wait. signing and it's nothing major. Wait. So, I actually never. I actually didn't see that. People are really actually going at him. Well, that people were funniest. Just... That's the funniest thing I've heard all week, man. It's like, why aren't you this other guy? What what kind of criticism what? is that? What am I supposed to do with that criticism? <laughs> under under his post about how excited he was to be a cult. That's that's what fans were saying to him. But then he decided to make another tweet, um, basically somewhere along the lines of saying like. I know I'm not big brother talking about Tyron Matthew without saying his name. Yeah. Um, he said, but let's not be disrespectful, basically, is what he said. Um, wow. And like, I was just crazy. I was like, this guy really has to say that? Like, like this is really what people are doing? Then I went and looked at the post, and it was flooded with comments. Like, like hey, have you heard about Tyron Matthew? Are you bringing Tyron Matthew with you? Why, why are you not Tyron Matthew? Wrong, wrong chief safety. That was a lot. Wrong chief safety. Fan, fans are crazy, man. You know that. Wow. Y'all, that guys, bro, ch ch chill out with that, please. Chill out with that. That that actually just annoyed the hell out of me. Um. Um. Uh, all right, so <laughs> moving on here, guys. We're gonna get into some draft stuff. That's why we got Kent on. He's math bomb, obviously. Uh, obviously, he's the creator of this thing. He also got Destin a better RAS than who? Um, hey, there's multiple people now. I've seen multiple lower than 2.42s come out uh, th these past few weeks. There's a tight end prospect I posted today that, that was lower than that. Was it yeah. Jelani Woods? Jelani Woods had, to, had the had the 10. No, yeah, say no, Jelani was... Woods was the perfect. What are you talking about? Oh, wait, who was uh, – I saw an RAS out there about Jelani Woods. I just didn't see the score. Which, who was the tight end? It was Jalen Weidermeyer from Texas A&M. Oh my who, god. Who before this process started was almost everyone's in everyone's top three and that at, tight, at the tight end pro spot. day and combine just it was Never. it was heading that way well before he actually tested, but when when he actually did test, I mean his his it just dropped well like running running a over 540 at your pro day 
Yeah. That's so uh, good. Because that, the problem that comes in there is there's pr- it's probably even worse than a 5 through. Is it 5 0 3? 5 0 3? Was it 5 0 2? 5 0 2. My bad. My bad, J- <laughs> my bad, Jalen. And it's, it's even worse because, like, the, the vert came and it was a, it was reported as a 35 and a half inch vert. And I was like, well, that ain't too bad. So maybe he just, maybe he got hurt or something. And then it was like, oh, hold up. No, we were wrong. It's actually a 25 and a half inch vert. So quite a bit of difference there. <laughs> 25 inches for a tight end. That's wow. not that's that's bad for a center. That's that's yeah. very bad. Wow. I mean, the thing with Ken is he's he probably has to see some just wildly great um athletic uh profiles, obviously. Right. And then he just sees some doozies of bad ones. Who who was it whose broad jump was like two? Like so, something nuts. Like <laughs> whoa, what? Oh. <laughs> No, I, I know what you're talking about. There's there's some bad bad tests out there that you'd just be like, how did how how do you even do that? Like, how can you even get that low of a score? And usually it's injury. Um, I think it was 2020. We actually had a guy sneak into a pro day and say he was from a smaller school and he tested and was terrible. Um, but like, yeah, that stuff pops up every now and again. Guys that that don't test very well at all. Um, we have the lowest bench I have in the database is zero, which is because he, he, he did do the bench. He, he attempted the bench and he repped none. And I had See, to actually, that's, that's when I, I as modify. a human, that's why when I, as a human would just not get on there. Like, I, I'm just being honest. Like if, if I know for a fact, I'm going to test that poorly at the bench, I'm saying my shoulder hurts that day. Like there are so many reasons to get off that bench right there. Yeah. We had a one this year. Um, I can't remember who it was, but we did have a one this year for the bench with somebody on the bench one. And I think we had a two also this year. So we've, we've seen some doozies. I don't, I don't post them on my timeline. Um, for those that do follow me, they would have seen what happened when I did post Weidermeyers. And I did because I was posting tight ends and he's a well-known player. I didn't want to not post him because then they would just ask, but um, a lot of the attention you get when you post that kind of stuff is, is very negative as you'd imagine. Um, and I try to avoid that type of stuff, but on an internal level, when I get to look at it, it's still, it's still kind of funny to see them. <laughs> oh, I bet. And you, you just sort through all of them, but we're, we're going to talk about so many prospects here so we can save it a little bit, but, um, I know what we're moving into here is it's draft season. Um, so we, we thought up the Colts top needs that they're most likely are going to go after in this year's draft. Um, If you ask me the top five needs for the Colts in any order, what I would say for the future are quarterback. We're going to leave quarterbacks off because we've talked about quarterback the entire off season. I think we all just need a break for a little while. Matt Ryan's here guys. Let's just live in it. Matty ice. But the other four, but the other four spots that I think consistently are what people would bring up are receivers, tight ends, Offensive tackle, preferably left tackle, but offensive tackle in general. Um, and then corner are the top four needs after quarterback for this team. So um, me and Kent are just going to kind of share some names that we have that are in our top tens for that um, those positions. Um, Michael is going to share on some on some prospects. He hasn't gone as deep into the scouting himself on that this year. So he's going to hold off on bringing a top 10, but he's still going to share thoughts on those players. Um, Kent, you want to go first or second on, and we're going to start with receivers. Um, I just accidentally clicked off of my sheet. So you go ahead while I pull my thing back up. Hey, that is all right. Wait, hold on, Destin. Hold on, Destin. You're forgetting the most important part before we start. This segment is brought to you by Topo Chico. Okay. Oh okay. my I'm gosh. Scared. All right. So we, we are all... not sponsored by to- Topo Chico. Um, but we're going to start with the receivers then. I'll go through my top 10. Um, I'm going to start um, with one, go to 10, um, and just share those names. I want to start by saying super deep receiver class. Um, these 10 names, I say, I would be shocked if we don't hear every single one of them in the top two rounds and we're probably going to hear about 15 to 16 um in the first two days at a minimum in my opinion um but receiver starting out so number one for me i have jamison williams from alabama even with the acl tear 
Um, I think ACL tears have just become a uh, very minor injury in the NFL anyway. Just feels like just about everyone recovers fully from it. You don't really lose any athleticism, especially at Jameson's age. I really have no concerns of him getting back to normal. Will he be out there day one? Um, probably not. Um, but I think he's that talented and that big of a difference maker that he is that good. Will he be the first receiver's name that you hear in the draft? Maybe not because of that injury, because of that day one need. Um, but he's my number one. At number two, I have Garrett Wilson from Ohio State. Um, I am shocked that before this, if you would have asked me a year ago, I don't even think Garrett Wilson would have been the best receiver on his team in this draft rankings. But Garrett Wilson became almost a security blanket for a young quarterback in C.J. Stroud this past year. His route tree is so extensive, in my opinion. He has that speed. He has the size you're going to like. Um, I think Garrett Wilson has a day one impact type of guy. Um, he's probably going to be the guy I think hears his name first in this receiver room, receiver position. So I have him at two. At three, I have Drake London. If, if you want to just watch some fun film and you want to watch fun 50-50 ball plays, Drake London's tape is full of them, man. Just moss and people at USC last year with – below average quarterback play at that. Um, I think Drake London has a chance to be the top name you hear as well. Um, I, I have him pretty high on my big board as well, but he's at three for me from USC. At four, I have Chris Olave from Ohio State. Um, love Chris Olave. He would have been a first round grade for me last year if he came out, um, went back to school. Um, I think Garrett Wilson jumping him here has nothing to do with Chris Olave as much as it did Garrett Wilson's play. Because I think Chris Olave is a great talent. I think he's another guy who's going to be able to come in, play right away, probably more so in the slot. But he has the ability to play both, in my opinion. After that, this, this is where it gets a little bit weird for people. Um, at five, I have George Pickens from Georgia. Big George Pickens fan. Um, and this is going to sound like a weird statement because he they won the national championship. But George Pickens also had very below average quarterback play. Um, Stinson Bennett is nowhere near an NFL quarterback. And George Pickens became a security blanket for him, was just there at all costs. I think his route tree is way more intensive than people actually imagine because he wasn't really able to use a lot of it with the quarterback play he had. Um, I think George Pickens is going to be a day one type producer for a team. Um, I hope it's the Colts obviously um, in the second round because I think I'm higher on him than most people are um, but I also wouldn't be shocked if George Pickens hears his name day one of the draft I really could see him sliding there in the end of the round because I think he's that talented number six for me I have Jahan Dotson from Penn State one of the most electric slot guys you're going to see in this draft quick love his release from the line of scrimmage love his release in his routes very crisp route running um, I think he just has a lot of separation on tape um, and a very good football conference in the Big Ten and it's going to keep going I know it sounds redundant athlete from Penn State right but he, he's just an uber athlete I think he's gonna he's gonna progress to the NFL with ease at number seven this guy probably in the initial before the combine before the pro day was a top three receiver on my board, had struggled a little bit at the combine, struggled, had, just didn't athletically please as many people as his tape does. Traylon Burks from Arkansas. Um, he's probably the biggest faller here for the receiver group for me, ending up at seven. Um, I still love his tape. I think in the SEC, he was still able to beat very, a lot of good corners um, and be able to put on very good film. Um, I think he could struggle with separation early on because of that lack of – um, bursting speed that you're going to want to see or track speed. Um, but I think he, with the right receiver coach, I think he can develop into a very good receiver. At eight, I have Sky Moore from Western Kentucky, another electric slot type guy who has a chance of going round one just because of how electric he is at that position. And this Debo Samuel type role that people are going to be throwing around and Tyree kills are going to open the door for these kind of receivers going forward. Like that's, the NFL, that's Western Michigan. Don't disrespect my Broncos. Western Michigan. I apologize. I don't know why I said Western Kentucky. It literally says Western Michigan right here. And I know that, but yeah, Sky Moore from Western Michigan. Um, the NFL is a copycat league, like I said. If you think that Debo Samuel role is just going to go away because the 49ers did it last year, you're insane. There's probably going to be three or four players that do it this year. And Cordell Patterson made the switch this last year that kind of did a little bit of both as well. Sky Moore is just another guy I think can go ahead and do that. 
at nine, I have Christian Watson from North Dakota State. Um, this might be a little lower than some than on than on him than some people have him. I have him at nine. Um, I think he is an uber athlete, obviously, and the can't can probably tell you that better than I can. But just lights out the combine. Love the size. I'm a little bit worried about the route running day one. I'm concerned on if his athleticism is going to be enough to create constant separation at the next level um, right away. I think the right coaching, this guy's ceiling is the sky um, and you can just keep going. Um, I have him at nine just because I'm a little bit concerned about that day one production, but not enough to drop him out of my top 10. And at number 10, a guy who, if his injury doesn't happen, is probably in my top five, John Mechie the third from Alabama. John Mechie was having a tremendous season. Um, was probably out playing Jamison Williams, but Jamison Williams had this, the traits and size that would probably still have him higher on this list. Um, but Mechie is a guy who, if he can recover fully, he's going to be a steal on day two of the draft, whoever gets him. Um, I'm really interested to see where he lands. I just think the speed he has, the route running, I really love his release in the middle to long, long route running wise, um, being able to get a little faster as his route goes on. Um, I really think John Mechie is a guy who, if he fully gets healthy, like I said, is going to be a steal for somebody. Dig it, man. <laughs> yeah, you got you got most of the same players as I have, but I don't think our order is remotely the same, which is great because that makes this kind of stuff fun. <laughs> that's the draft. That's the draft, Kent. Man, everybody sees it. Yeah. Um, I'll jump right into mine then. So my number one is Drake London. You mentioned the fifty-fifty balls. Um, I was surprised watching Drake London, how few of those there were, because I was, I was hyped up to see those because that's what his reputation was. But as as good as he is on those type of plays, he is a better yards after the catch guy than I expected. He runs a much more diverse route, route tree than I had expected. And that the whole idea of him as a jump ball specialist is just not fully encapsulating the type of player that Drake London is. Um, he hasn't tested yet, so I don't have a chance to give a raz. I probably might, I might not even get one. I don't know if he's going to even be ready to test by the time he does. He has a personal pro day scheduled sometime this week, I think. Um, my number two was Chris Olave, one of the fastest guys in the draft. Um, speed's been his game. I also had a first round grade on him last year. I was actually surprised he didn't come out last year. Um, it should pay off though, because I, I would expect him to go pretty high in the first round. Um, my number three was Jamison Williams. Wish we would have been able to get some testing on him. You mentioned the ACL injury that, 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 uh, Williams has and Mechie as well. Um, unfortunately we're not able to get the speed, but he's, he's just all wheels, man, all wheels. And you can find a spot in an offense for a guy like that because his root tree is diverse enough that you can do more than just run goes all day. You know, you, you can do other stuff with him. Um, if he gets healthy, he's going to be a really dangerous weapon. Uh, my number four, you didn't mention, um, but I don't I don't expect him to be this high on a lot of people's boards. I've been higher on him for quite a while, which is Jalen Tolbert out of South Alabama. Um, Tolbert's a very physical receiver, very athletic receiver, very explosive player. Uh, doesn't have the same kind of top end speed as some of the other guys do, but he's, he's plenty fast. Um, smaller school tends to get you a little bit overlooked, but I think that he's got not just starter uh, starting caliber potential in the NFL, uh, but he could be a real star. And one of the guys that I compared him to was Michael Pittman, as far as both play style and the type of player that he is as a receiver. Don't get, don't get Michael too excited. You mentioned <laughs> Michael Pittman and Michael's going to run laps, but I will say for Tolbert, he, I think he, well, let's pull up my big boy real quick. looks like he finished up at receiver 14. Um, I had a real big run on those like smaller slot yeah. guys right in front of him. So if we just did outside guys, I'm sure he's in that like top seven for that range. Yeah. And he's, I've, I've been higher on him since the very beginning of the season. I've been, I've been high on him for very long. He actually started the season out as my wide receiver one. Um, I dropped him behind other guys shortly after I watched him because they're just better prospects. He's a good prospect, but he's not quite on that level. Um, number five for me is Garrett Wilson. You already pretty much mentioned all the reasons why Garrett Wilson's a fantastic player. Um, and there's a lot of really good stuff to him. For me, he never quite did enough to jump over Olave um, but it's, it's enough. And again, this is a really deep wide receiver class and it's very strong at the top. So all of these rankings are pretty close together. Um, six for me is Sky Moore. Um, I mentioned before the broadcast, we, we started actually, actually recording that, that the comp for him has been Golden Tate from the beginning. And then he tested as almost exactly a carbon copy of Golden Tate. 
Um, he's he's got great change of direction on film. He's he's a very quick and agile guy, but he didn't test that way. He tested out as a more explosive and fast rather than a, uh, an agile guy. But that's how Golden Tate tested too. So whatever kind of juice Golden Tate had to be that kind of guy on film, I think Sky Moore's got the same thing. And I think that he's got that kind of potential in the NFL. He can play both inside and out. I think you're going to do the most damage with him, though, using him as a slot receiver and having him just, just school people on change of direction. Um, I have Christian Watson all the way up at seven. And this is, this is one of those things where it's a little bit less about my own event. Evaluation of him. You mentioned uh, the testing. He tested phenomenally at the combine. Um, I got to watch him in person at the Senior Bowl, and what was great about that, seeing those guys in person, was the weather was garbage. It, it rained the entire time we were down there. It was cold. Um, this is not the greatest conditions to be catching a football. Uh, but the only receiver who seemed to have no problem catching the football, no matter what, was Christian Watson. Even when it started to get really wet and rainy, he was still catching the football with ease. And I think that speaks a lot to, to one of his weaknesses on tape, which is his ability to catch and to be able to, to, to really haul the ball in with his hands. Um, he tested out as a very big and fast guy, uh, but he also tested out pretty good for the agilities. And that's usually a question with those big, fast guys is can they be quicker and, and advance their root trees in different ways? Um, the next guy I had was Traylon Burks. I had never been a really big Jaylen, Traylon Burks fan. I actually didn't move him at all in my rankings after his combine performance, because for me, that was pretty close to what I kind of expected. I didn't expect him to be some ridiculous tester. I didn't expect him to be that, that guy. Um, so for me, he, he's, he's fine. He's a good enough athlete. He does a lot of stuff that you want to do. He's a very physical player. Um, he understands spacing on the field really well. Um, but he did disappoint, I think, a lot in, in the draft process. And I kind of understand why people have been drop, dropping him down their boards. Um, my number nine is John Mechie. You've already pretty much covered all the reasons why. If he wasn't health, if he was healthy, he would be rated a lot higher. Um, and kind of the same reason for the next one, which was George Pickens for me. Um, another guy kind of like Burks, but I haven't really been that much of a fan of, of Pickens. Um, he did test really well for a guy his size. You, you see that on tape, and I'm a big fan of, of not counting things twice, just like I didn't with Burks. I didn't move him down. I didn't move Pickens up because I expected him to test really well. Um, definitely got some starting caliber traits there. I think he's going to gonna have a pretty decent career in the NFL. Yeah, and Stinson, Stinson Bennett again. Hey, um, no, no, I, no slander for a national champion now. Hey, hey, he is happy for him, and I bet he had the time of his life doing it. It's just always a big plus to me for a guy when I can say with certainty his quarterback play is improving at the next level. Um, and, I'm again, nothing against Stinson Bennett. There's just not an NFL starter that's going to be worse than Stinson Bennett. I'm just being honest about it. I'm sorry. Um, but, yeah, I mean, a lot of the same names. Um, Jalen Tolbert, um, I've been told by many people I'm lower on him than I should be. I was even told by an NFL scout, I want to say three days ago, um, he said, I promise you, he is not the 14th receiver taken. Um, and I understand that. Um, I've just always uh, allowed myself to stay where I, what I watch and use it. Um, but I have been told by many people I'm lower on, on him than I should be. But again, if I only looked at outside guys, maybe the speed from these inside guys and these, the role that I can see some of them playing is putting them a little bit higher in my mind than I need to with the Sky Moors. And you, you said it too, but Calvin Austin, for example, who's over him at 13. Wondell Robinson, um, who's over him at 12. Those kind of guys that are kind of coming up that are above him for that reason but I, I like Tolbert I would love him I'd love to see him in Indy I would Destin had said it earlier I haven't done the all the biggest studying but for the wide receivers I have and I did create a top 10 for this segment of the wide receivers so I have Garrett Wilson as my wide receiver number one I, I've watched this dude since he was a sophomore at Lake Travis he just showed up in every playoff game they ever needed him, leaping over everyone and their mama. The separation at the high school translating over to college. And like Kent said, with, with Chris Olave, he was surprised that Chris Olave went back. But Garrett Wilson just, just exploded. The jump ball ability, and I think he makes an even bigger jump in the NFL. When I think about ceilings, 
I think Wilson has the higher ceiling than a guy like Williams in London because given the situation he goes to, the quarterback he goes to, I easily see him ha- having the better career um, stat-wise, production-wise, than guys like Jamison Williams and Drake London. So number one is going to be Garrett Wilson for me. I mean, I've watched this dude for like eight years, man. This dude has just grown, 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 and gotten better. Number two is going to be Jamison Williams for me. Um uh, Gadget guy, he can play inside, he can play outside the athleticism. Like Kent said, I wanted to see that testing. I wanted to see the broad jump. I wanted to see the vertical because he definitely would have had a top five at the combine and probably the best of the pro day at Alabama. But fortunately, it just didn't happen for him. Uh, Obviously, hope the best for him. Number three is going to be Drake London from USC. This is a guy who, like, of course, I see a little bit of Michael Pittman, and of course, Michael Pittman coming out. I saw a little bit of Reggie Wayne in Michael Pittman and how just how he ran his routes, how he caught the ball, all that stuff. But with Drake, it's a little bit, I guess you could say, a little bit more what, what was the word? Elusive, more athletic. He's going to be my number three for me. For number four is going to be Chris Olave, a guy who, like Destin said, would have probably been a first rounder guy last year, going to be a first rounder this year. He's a guy who can, again, play inside and out. One of the better route runners in the class. Great pass catcher. Played at Ohio State. So, of course, you know they had a quarterback. They had offense. They had a ton of passing yards. He was featured in that offense, okay? Then I'm going to have Jahan Dotson from Penn State. Like Destin said, when it comes to recruiting, that's really how how they operate. They look for athletes, man. They look for athletes, athletes, athletes and get them into spring ball, and they'll figure out what they play in the NFL. That's just how their recruiting system how their recruiting system works, and it works out for them. But for Jahan, this is a guy who, of course, like a guy like K.J. Hamler, who came out of Penn State, I believe he went to the Broncos in the third round, I believe, of that class. This is a guy who is like a few steps above K.J. Hamler, a lot faster, much more shiftier, a lot better separation this is a guy who I have at five who I would, of course, be happy with, but he's not going to be there, obviously, at 42. He's just got it all in him, in my opinion. He can go anywhere on the field, and he's just fast. The athleticism, it's all over the place. At number six, I'm actually going to go George Pickens. Uh, I remember watching him a little bit, and, he's, and he showed some good stuff. I believe he was learning under guys like Lawrence Cager at Georgia a couple of years ago, but – the climbing, the climbing he did, obviously the leaping grab he had in the national championship, just the separation. Obviously, when you watch a couple of those films, Destin, the, the blocking, he just <laughs> throws the dude to the ground and he's just so physical. Now, in the NFL, I don't think you're, you're going to be able to do that against grown ass men, but he shows the physicality to, and the willingness to block. I have, have him as my number six. My number seven is going to be Christian Watson. Six and seven was hard for me. It it was harder than one and two were for me, honestly, because I really like Watson. Like we've said, Claypool, the Chase Claypool, but a little bit smaller, not as heavy, not as bulky as Chase Claypool, but he's just as athletic. He can be used in so many ways in so many offenses. I don't necessarily see a Debo Samuel. He's not going to be lining up at running back But, man, the jet sweeps, obviously the separation, the route running now at D2, of course, that's one thing. So I had to take that into consideration. When I do these draft stuff, who you go against and who, what you put on tape against who matters to me. And it matters a lot to me. So for those reasons, I had George Pickens over Christian Watson at number eight. Had Sky Moore, obviously, and this is not Sky Moore, the linebacker, the former Colts linebacker. This is the wide receiver, Sky Moore, okay? So had to, obviously, this guy didn't just go back to college and become a wide receiver. But for all the reasons that Destin and Kent said, you just see the Debo comparison. You see the guy who is so shifty, can play inside and out. Obviously, the better of the guys like Calvin Austin the third, Wandale Robinson. Number nine is going to be Traylon Burks from Arkansas. I still that that athleticism, you know, those traits. I see it. I, I see it in him. I, I definitely like what I see. The hands, the long arms. In the SEC, you know, the quarterback situation wasn't the greatest at Arkansas, so he didn't have the best opportunities to put his skill set on film. But guys like George Pickens 
was able to do that with Stetson Benson, Stetson Bennett. But number 10, number 10 is a guy that I'm really, 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 really high on, and that's Alec Pierce. I think what Destin loved about last year's Elijah Moore at the line of scrimmage is what I love about Alec Pierce. I mean, this is how this guy gets his separation at the line of scrimmage. His footwork, in my opinion, is top three in this class, maybe even top two above Jamison Williams and possibly Chris Olave. This guy's just a technician. He's everything you want. And I think Alec Pierce would be the perfect player, the first protege that Reggie Wayne would want as a rookie to come into his room because we already know he's got Michael Pittman. But for Alec Pierce, obviously, blocking, I think, is okay. Playing at Cincinnati, you didn't play the greatest corners, most physical corners, did enough, solid catching. He was on somewhat of a security blanket for Desmond Ritter at times. So that would be my list at the wide receiver position. I will say, me and Kent, neither of us said Alec Pierce, but I was told by an NFL scout today, and I mean today, that that their team that he worked for had Alec Pierce as their receiver five. This, this position group is just wildly seen differently across the league. There's just so many different people at different spots. Um, I like Alec Pierce a lot. Um, he's going to fall in that top 15 realm for me uh, when my big board comes out. Um, check it out on the Blue Stable on Monday. Um, shameless plug there. Um, but we're, we're going to move on to tight ends real quick here, um, going down the list. Um, and I'll go ahead and start it out, um, and then we'll go to Kent. So at one, I have Trey McBride. Um, I just think he is going to be the easiest transition to the NFL. Tight end's a tough position for rookies. A lot of them struggle to produce early. But I think Trey McBride has the best chance as a pass catcher to produce day one. Um, and that's, that's going to make him number one for me. At number two, a different element at tight end, um, Jeremy Rucker. I, I think he's the best blocking tight end in this class. Um, and then throw in the fact that I do think he's going to have – more opportunities to be a pass catcher at this next level. Um, so I have Jeremy Rucker at number two from Ohio State. Number three, a guy who was my guy at tight end before the combine hits and became a household name um, and RAS-wise, you know, took the crown even. Um, number three, Jelani Woods. Um, I had him at tight end four before the combine even started just because even his Oklahoma State film, before he transfers to Virginia, I saw so much athleticism that I just knew at the NFL level he's going to get an opportunity. Um, and then you go to Virginia, I think he gets a little bit more poise. He definitely still has a lot of coaching that's going to have to happen. Um, his, his route tree is not very extensive yet. Um, I think he's going to need to get that coached up for sure. But I'll say this, Frank Reich knows how to use tight ends. He knows how to get the most out of him. I, I would love Jelani Woods in Indianapolis. Um, at number four, a guy who did not test well, and I'm really questioning why because the tape does not show that, is Isaiah Likely from Coastal Carolina. Um, did not test well. Um, I mean, in the RAS system, Kent will be able to share that too. Just low score for him. Um, on tape, very electric type player. I think he has a more excessive and more – diverse route tree even than a Jelani was. I just saw so much on tape. It was just Coastal Carolina. The, the talent he's facing comes into play here, but did test poorly during this draft process. Really shocked about it, but he's at four for me. At five, I have Kate Otten. Um, I think Kate Otten showed a little bit on tape of the blocking ability as well, but I also think he's going to be a guy who – after some coaching is going to be able to be a very solid receiver option in the NFL, even, even from Washington. I just really think he's going to be able to put that on display at six, a guy that I really do not want to try to pronounce his name. Chigo Zim Okwanowo. Chigo Okonkwo. I'm going to give myself a C plus for effort. <laughs> uh, um, Wait, is that the, he doesn't have relation to Albert O, does he? Um, no, no, different, different name. Okay, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So, so coming out of Maryland, freak athlete. Um, you just see it on tape. Um, I bet um, if he was a little bit bigger, 
Um, his little testings in the RAS system for sure would probably be boosted. Only 6'2". Um, I don't know if this is a guy that could be someone that the Colts um, would want to draft necessarily um, just because they already have that smaller type tight end in Kylan Granson from last year. But I do think there's a role for him. I just think there's w- so many different ways to be able to use um, a guy like Man, it sucks when I can't pronounce their names because I don't want to say it again. Um, but I, I really do think athleticism-wise, it's going to translate to the next level, um, and I think he's going to get a chance. At seven, a guy I'm lower on than most um, is Greg Dulich from UCLA. And I know I've seen, I've seen some people even have him as their tight end one. Um, I'm just not there on it. Um, I just see a lot of things they're going to have to get coached. Um, I really am not a fan of his hands in general, just – I see some issues in the dropping department. I see some issues with the blocking areas of how he uses his hands where I think he'll struggle at the next level. Um, But the right coach gets a hold of him. I think he has the traits that can definitely get him there. At eight, um, Cole Turner um, from Nevada. I think, and again, I think he's going to be one of those day three tight ends that you can draft um, that has the upside as a pass catcher that you want to take on day three, um, where we see all these great tight ends come from is day three somehow. Um, So I think Colt Turner just has a chance to get some teams excited because of that. Um, At number nine, Charlie Kolar from Iowa state on film, crazy pass catcher. Um, just has the ability to high point the ball. I even have on my write up form. I think he high points the ball better than any tight end in this class personally um, at a very consistent rate. I think that's going to be something that teams are going to highlight for him. Um, um, it'll be interesting to see athleticism wise, if he's able to create separation at a constant rate, but I'm just envisioning Charlie Kolar in the red zone, the little throwback to the corner. And I see multiple teams being very happy with a Charlie Kolar pick at number 10, a guy who for a lot of people was in their top three at tight ends tested absolutely horrible Jalen Weidermeyer he still ends up in my top 10 just because on tape I see so much potential in different ways Um, I, I didn't expect him to test like as a crazy athlete by any means but to test as poorly as he did twice um, because we were really, I was really hoping the pro day would at least bump him up a little bit and he'd be able to improve it. Um, it, it only got worse for him. Um, I don't know if there's some things going on behind the scenes there for that and the reasoning. Because um, on tape, I wouldn't say he is a terrible athlete, um, but I would have guessed that he was below average. Big, big it, man. Yeah, again, we got pretty much all the same players with the exception of one. Um, and we actually started out with the same number one this time. Trey McBride, I got to watch when I was down in the senior bowl. Trey McBride was awesome. Almost no one could, could beat Trey McBride one-on-one when they were doing blocking drills. Uh, when they started doing receiving drills, it was, it was equally, equally it was as good. Um, fantastic player. Um, actually tested better than expected. I didn't expect him to test out uh, that well in the time drills, and he actually crushed the time drills. You're on a four, five, nine. Um, and his splits were even better than projected for that speed at his position. So very good on him. Very, very happy for him. Um, ended up in that that above eight range for, for Raz, which at tight end is, is a much better predictor than any other position. Uh, my m- number two is Greg Dulcich from UCLA. Um, I don't really have a, a, a very solid grasp on all the tight ends in this class as far as my rankings. My rankings are always pretty fluid. It's, it's more, a, I, I t- tend to rank more in tiers. Um, but I think Dulce is going to be a starter. I think he's going to be a starter in the NFL. I think he's going to be able to jump right in in a tight end two role and take on a tight end one role as he progresses in his career. Um, if he's able to harness those athletic talents, which don't always show up on tape. Um, my number three was Isaiah Likely, And that's even after he tested and tested poorly, um, which for me is a much bigger deal than it is for most people. Uh, tight end is just not a position that translates well to poor athletes. Um, there's only one tight end in the last 20 years who's had a below average Raz and done anything in the NFL of note. Um, and you have to really stretch it when you say he was a poor athlete, um, which was Jordan Reed. Because Jordan Reed, surprise, was injured during his, his uh, pre draft process. So he didn't do the explosion drills. He didn't do the agility drills. And he had a poor bench. So he's an undersized tight end, had a poor bench, ran well but that still ends up as being a below, below average athlete for a, for a system like Raz. 
Um, but I don't think he would have been if he had tested fully. Um, other than him, no one, not a single tight end has done anything of note in the last 20 years. And I think you have to go all the way back to like 96 to find a tight end that did. Um, so you're, you're, it's not a really good thing when a tight end doesn't test well and likely didn't. He ran a four, eight, four, I think it was, um, in his 40, um, great explosion drills, which is very important for tight ends. Um, I still love him. I still love his tape. I'm still, I'm still in on him as a player. I'm still hopeful that he, he can be successful in the NFL. The question becomes value. And that's where it gets really tough because as much as I love him as a player, the chances of success are just so low. Um, after him, I have Jeremy Ruckert. You already kind of mentioned why Ruckert's a very good all around player. He's been hurt during the pre-draft process. So he hasn't tested um, just generally good player. He's just kind of good at everything. Does not great at anything, but good enough at everything to, to make himself a productive player. Uh, my number five was Kate Otten. Kate Otten's a fantastic blocker. He comes from a system that uses their tight ends um, pretty dynamically in the blocking game. And he's able to do quite a, quite a few different things as a blocker. Um, really like what he brings to the table. And he's going to start from day one in most NFL offenses because most NFL offenses now use two tight ends to start. Um, he'll get plenty of play time as a rookie. Um, probably won't get as many targets, but he'll get plenty of play time, assuming that he's, he's fully healed up. He's also dealing with an injury. Uh, my number six was Jelani Woods. Jelani Woods is, uh, broke a 22 year streak for tight for uh, Raz at tight end. Um, he's the first first 10 in 22 years, which is, is fantastic for him. Um, he's huge. He's six foot seven and tested phenomenally, even in agility drills, which guys his size do not test well in. And he was still able to um, a sub seven three cone at six, seven is crazy talk. And he was able to pull it off like it was nothing. And from what I heard from people that were in attendance, it looked easy for him. Everything that he did was just fluid and just cake that kind of athlete doesn't come along very often and i wasn't as high on his tape but that's projectable man you can do a lot with that from being uh, at the combine i just have to say seeing a person six seven move like that just like below the hips in general it looked like something that should be illegal yeah. um it, it, it just didn't look normal it just looked like i was watching something like if you're watching a movie and you have like the fast forward two on the entire yeah. time you're watching like that's what it looked like watching galani woods run some of those drills and we had jordan davis in the same combine so we ended up watching a couple of those things that just don't make sense and it's like physics is supposed to be one of those things you can't mess with some people found a way to um my number seven was jake ferguson not super high on guys that are just kind of okay. Um, but the, the draft class for me kind of, kind of falls off a little bit at that point. Um, not to say that he's a bad player. He's just not a very notable one. He's, he's an average athlete. He's a decent pass catcher. He's a decent blocker. Uh, I think an NFL team is going to find him and make him their tight end three. And he could have a very long productive career as a T2, TE3 and have a really good career that way. That's totally acceptable. You can make a lot of good money that way. Um, the next one for me is Charlie Kohler. He tested insane for what was expected of him. Almost no one was calling him testing well. Um, and he tested very, very well. Uh, he ran really well. He, he posted good explosion drills. Everything he did was really good. And very little of that shows up on tape. He's got fantastic hands. He runs a pretty diverse route tree. Um, he's a, a good enough blocker. He's got really good size, uh, but speed doesn't really show up in his game a whole lot. Um, he definitely isn't quick on tape. He doesn't have a whole lot of, of lateral quickness. He doesn't change direction very well. Some of that explosiveness doesn't really show up on tape. Um, but with everything he does have, having that level of athletic talent gives you something to project because you've already got the hard stuff down. All you got to do is teach him all the stuff that you that that's teachable, all the stuff you can get a guy to learn. He's got to do that stuff and he's got everything else going for him, um, which makes it really hard for me to project. I, I should love him way more than I do based on his testing. Um, Chigo Okonkwo is my nine. Um, I wanted to share with you the, the comparison because it's always been my comparison for him and he could not have nailed this more during his testing. When I was watching him at Maryland, he looked like Delaney Walker. And, and everything he did, the way he moves, the way he runs, he looked like Delaney Walker. He ran a 4.52. Delaney Walker ran a 4.54. He's 6'2, 238. 
Delaney Walker was 6'1", 240, almost exactly the same size. Um, he had a, a 35 and a half inch vert. Delaney Walker had a 36 and a half inch vert. Nine, nine, uh, nine foot, nine inch broad. Delaney Walker had 9'10". He had a better shuttle than Delaney Walker did by quite a bit. And he had a, almost exactly the same three cone as Delaney Walker did. Uh, almost every metric is either very close or almost the exact same thing as Delaney Walker. And the play style is there. So even though he doesn't have an elite test from, uh, from a RAS standpoint, he's got a very projectable profile because stylistically, we already know what that looks like. All you got to do is use him like they've been using Delaney Walker for a decade and you've got your guy. Um, number 10 for me is Cole Turner. I really wanted to have Turner a lot higher. Um, when I got to see him in person, he, the hands just weren't there for me. And that was a big, that was a strong point for me on tape. And then when I got to see him in person, it just, it just wasn't quite there. Um, he looks very slender. I'm not sure that his flame, his frame is fully built out. He's got a lot of, a lot of growing to do from an athletic standpoint, from a physical standpoint. Um, I'm not sure you're going to get the same level of, of, uh, of rookie start time that you're going to get from some of these other guys. He doesn't have a projectable role in year one, like some of these other guys do. Um, I still think he's a good prospect. I think there's a lot of stuff you can do with him. His upside is definitely, definitely higher. Um, I just think the floor is much lower for him than it is some of those other guys. And that's the 10. <laughs> and that's the 10. Yeah. That that's the 10 for the tight end. Let's move on to the offensive tackles. Colts fans, not guards, tackles, okay? Not guards, tackles. Kent, the whole fan base went crazy when we lost out on a guard, okay? <laughs> and that's why I got to preface this, all right? Let's get into the tackles, all right? Dustin, let's start with you, then we'll get to Kent, and then we'll get into the cornerbacks, all right? Dustin, let's start. Yeah, so this is a really fun tackle class at the top, especially. Um, I don't think it's as deep um, starter-wise after you get past, for sure, the top 10. I see some guys with starter potential in the entirety of my top 10, for example. But after that, it, you see a little bit of a drop-off, or there's going to be very few names after that that I think could do that. So um, at number one, um, I do have um, Ikem E. Conway from North Carolina State. Um his, his tape is just ridiculous. And I understand people are going to say that it's not the same caliber of players that cross and Neil played at being at Bama, Mississippi state being in the sec, but I, I just don't know if there's a player at the tackle position that I can feel more confident that you can put in day one and he can hold his own against most edge rushers in the NFL. I really think Iquanu, Iquanu, I love his center mass. Um, I love that he's able just to be able to stay very level um, off the line of scrimmage um, and be able to do that at a high rate. Um, I love the, his usage of his hands early. Um, so I definitely have him at tackle one. Um, and I don't, th I don't have it as close as some other people. Um, I just really feel like he's tackle one and Ken's going to give his after this. And I'm sure he won't be one and he'll tell me why I'm stupid. Um, but I, I just, I really have a hard time not having him at one. So number two, I don't um, think I have, you're stupid. I just think you're wrong. Hey, and that's fine. And that's fine. Uh, number two, I have Evan Neal. Um, Neal's tape is just picture perfect. Like what you're going to want to see from a tackle. I think he's going to be able to come in and play right away as well at the tackle position. Um, I guess the thing that kind of left it off a little bit to me than Econ Iqu was, I just think Neal has a, some times on tape where he overcompensates off the line of scrimmage jump. And when you do that at the NFL level, you're just asking for some trouble at times. And I think the right coach will get that under control. And it wasn't something that I think happens at a very high rate for Neil. Um, but I just think that's kind of what fell him at two for me at three. I have Charles cross from Mississippi state um, cross is a guy who I've seen some people have at one. Um, he's only six, five, which only six, five sounds crazy. Um, but there's just some massive guys at, at tackle in the NFL. Um, so I think that kind of made it to where he would drop to three for me. Um, but I mean, when you look at his game, there's just very little weaknesses at the tackle spot for him. I just think he's going to be able to come in and start right away and not really struggle much. Um, just being six, five, I think he's going to be a little bit smaller than some tackles at number four probably one of the meanest dudes in the draft. I have Trevor Penning. Um, so at the senior bowl, 
You probably saw the sound bites. You probably seen everything you need to see. Um, edge rushers hate this guy. Um, he, he does not make friends with pass rushers. Um, he reminds me a lot of Quentin Nelson personality wise. If the Colts could find a way to pair him, I just think on the left side, that would be ridiculous. Now, I think he's a little bit uber aggressive at times, um, and that could get him on tape where he tries to finish a guy too early. And at the NFL level, if you're going against a Miles Garrett or you're going against a TJ Watt, I think you could see a situation where you go for the finish too early as a tackle and it bites you in the butt and they're able to put a move on you and they go over. Being at Northern Iowa, he didn't really see those caliber of guys. Um, so that wasn't an issue on, for him on tape. But that's kind of why I have him at tackle four for me. Um, for tackle five, I have Bernhard Rainman from Central Michigan. Um, this is, I think there's a real chance that all five of these guys hear their names day one. I think four tackles going in round one is a lock in my opinion. Um, but I really, if you put a gun to my head and ask me to make a prediction right now, I would say five tackles go round one. And I think Rain, Rainman was the next one for me. Um, just a, for being at Central Michigan, very big tackle, 6'6", 303. You don't really see those at these smaller non-Power 5 schools. Um, so him being able to fall there is a little bit crazy, um, even to be at that kind of smaller school. Sorry, um, you're from Michigan, so you may think I'm hating on them a little bit. Um, but I have him there at five. So at six, a guy who some have even said could play guard in the NFL level, Nicholas petit Ferrari. Um um, from Ohio State. I think he's going to be a tackle at the next level. Still a little bit smaller than most being at 6'5". Um, I still think he's going to be a guy. I think he even plays left tackle. I just think he played that more at, in the college level being at Ohio State. I think there's going to be enough to, on tape, enough good edge rushers that he faced that he's going to get to stay at tackle. Um, he's probably he's going to get his name called on day two if I had to pr predict. Um, so I have them there at six at seven i have a guy who some people are higher on um daniel falali from minnesota on tape i just struggle man he's huge don't get me wrong he is huge i'm really excited to hear what jersey size goodell has to hold in front of him when he holds it on draft day um it won't it may not be goodell who knows it may be in the second or third round so it won't be goodell but i'd love to see some small man have to hold that jersey for him so Daniel Falali, 6'8", 383. Ridiculous size. A team is going to fall in love with that. Don't get me wrong. But on tape again, I just see a guy who really overcompensates off the line of scrimmage, um, shoots back a little bit too far. That's going to get him beat in the NFL level a lot, in my opinion. And the other problem is if he doesn't take that excessive off the snap, get a lot of speed rushers are just going to go around him. Um, so I just think there's going to be a lot of things that need to be polished for him at the next level if he's going to start right away, and that's kind of why he falls down to seven. So after this, this is where the realm of guys become a little bit, do these guys start day one? Abraham Lucas from Washington State is who I have at eight. Dare Rosenthal from Kentucky at nine, who, again, some people have had the conversation as, does he play guard at the next level? I think he'll play tackle personally. And at 10, I have Rashid Walker from Penn State. Um, I think those three are really good to pair together there because I just think they're all guys that may not be able to start right away, probably hear their names in the third round, maybe the fourth round area. Um, so those are guys that I would love to see become starters in the NFL, but I think there's some more questions. Cool. I love it, man. And we actually had a couple of guys in the same spot, uh, but uh, our four, top four are actually the same four players just in a different order. Um, I didn't have Iquanu as number one. I, I love Iquanu's tape. He's a top seven player, probably for me, six or seven. Um, but I, I had Evan Neal over him. It's weird that Evan Neal has had the kind of draft as he's had. He's been a, the top tackle or listed as a top tackle for like three years. And he just isn't blowing everybody away, even though his tape is fantastic. And everything about his game looks like it's going to translate really well. He's had the quietest draft process of any tackle I can imagine in many, many years. Um, but I still have him as number one. And then I have Aquano as two. Um, Aquano is small for a tackle. Um, he's a gigantic person, but for a tackle, he's small. Tackles are just big. 
Uh, they're just big people. He's only six um, four. Yeah. Um, but he's a fantastic athlete and he's good in every part of the game. Um, people are going to talk about moving him inside the guard probably when he starts his NFL career. And I can see that. But for me, he's a tackle. Put him on the outside, let him crush the ball. Um, that length isn't going to be a problem in the NFL because he's just so good at bursting off the line. Uh, my number three is Charles Cross, just like yours. Love Cross. He didn't test out as an elite athlete, but he was kind of close. Um, could be the best pass protector in the whole draft. Has a little bit of work to do in the run game. Um, a lot of really good projectable traits. Um, then you get kind of into the opposite with Trevor Penning, just a mean, mauling, run blocking monster. Gets himself in trouble at times because of his over aggressiveness. That will be a problem when he gets to the NFL. Um, but it, it can be overcome. We've seen guys that have, have learned to get over that kind of stuff after a, a couple of years in the NFL. Um, then we had uh, Tyler Smith from Tulsa is my, my number five. Uh, Tyler Smith's big. He's another guy that could play guard when he starts out his NFL career. Good athlete. Lots of really good projectable traits to him. Um, physical guy. Really good mover. Um, all the stuff you really want to see on tape. Um, Bernard Raymond was my six. I would love to have him higher. He's a fantastic athlete. He's got some good tape. Um, doesn't have a whole lot of good tape against good players, but he's, he's a pretty good player in his own right. He's a lot older than most NFL prospects. Um, I think he's 24, he'll be 25 when he starts his NFL career. So a good four to five years older than most NFL prospects are. Um, but he's a really good player and he seems like he's having a good time in the, uh, in the whole draft process. And as long as you're enjoying it, man, that's, that's good. Enjoy what you can. Man. It's the only, you only have to do this stuff once. Um, I also had Abraham Lucas um, as my number seven. You had him as eight. Um, another guy that I think is going to have a little bit of hard, harder time pro progress or projecting into the NFL at first, uh, but he's got all the traits there that you want to get from a guy that you want to put into in, in your tackle position. Um, left tackle traits probably won't start his career at left tackle, probably going to get moved around a little bit to get him some experience and get him, get him acclimated to the NFL. Uh, Daniel Fa'alele and Matt, w Matt Willetsko are my next, my next two guys for the same reason. Um, Fa'alele is huge. You already mentioned he's, he's 6'8 and 390 pounds, huge human being. We saw him down in Mobile and the fact that he's that much bigger than everybody else that's down there. Again, tackles are huge. And he just makes everyone look small. Um, not a very good athlete, even for his size, but not really that much of a concern when you don't win through your athletic talent. He wins because he's got ridiculous length and because he's so big and he can make that kind of stuff work. Matt, well, let's go out of North Dakota is the same type of player, only he's got those athletic traits. Um, you know, he's not 6'8", 390. Uh, he came in at 6'7", 312, which is quite a bit smaller. But here's the important part for the way that Willetsko plays. Um, Fa'alele had a wingspan of 86 inches. Uh, Willetsko had a wingspan of 85 and 5'8", almost the exact same wingspan from a smaller player. Um, and he's a much better athlete. I think his actual range is better than Fa'alele's. And he's got a much more projectable skill set from an athletic talent standpoint. Um, really want to see what he can do with a good coaching staff like my Lions have on the offensive line. You got to, got to get some of my guys in there. Um, I also had Rasheed Walker at 10. He hasn't really, he hasn't tested during the draft process. He's dealing with an injury he's recovering from um, really hope that we would have got a chance to see him. Another guy that's just really big and he's got some good athletic traits. Um, I really wish we could have seen him actually test those so we can see how good they were. Um, but I think that he projects to be a starting left tackle in the NFL, just probably not right away. He's probably going to start on the right side. Maybe somebody tries to push him inside to guard. I don't know if that's really going to work out, but um, I think in long term, he's got a lot of really good left tackle traits. Yeah, so I will say um, one of the names you said. Um, the reason he wasn't in my top 10 is because I do have him listed as a guard. Just it had a lot of going in between. Yeah. There's a lot of those guys in this class. So Tyler Smith, um, I did end up listing him at the guard spot. Um, he did fall at 51 in my overall big board. So look, if I did. Right him, yeah. So literally going over there, making him a tackle, um, he would line up as my tackle six. Um, so right after Rayman, right before Nicholas Petit. Um, 
So if he if you did switch it, there's a lot of those guys in this class that are yeah. those in between position even the guys. guys at the top, you know, oh yeah, the guys for at the sure. Top, you know, Equanu. We see them with Smith, Raymond because of his uh, because of how he came from a tight end, moved to tackle. He's, they're they're saying you know maybe start him at guard so he can get used to stuff. Um, I heard somebody say put Faalele at guard, and I think you've kind of crossed a line at that point if you're putting that guy inside. How are you going to throw over? him? And say if you put him if you put him at center, you're just making it to where you have to move everybody <laughs> over two feet uh, to be able to fit him in the center, I guess. But uh, no quarterback is going to look over that man. Get him in Arizona and have Kyler Murray say, ima- stand on the back of Kyler Murray. <laughs> Imagine him having to be the center for Kyler Murray, who I believe wholeheartedly is five foot six. Um, I don't care what he's listed at in the NFL. Nobody will tell me otherwise until I stand next to this man. I think he's five six. So just imagining him right there behind in front of him, that would be hilarious. Dude, he is a legit like five ten, five nine. Stop trying to there's no chance. Him. First of all, first of all, could he be like five eight? Maybe he is not five ten, and I refuse to believe that. Oh I know what gosh. he's listed at. I don't care. He is not five ten. I'm sorry. I've seen five ten men. He is not five ten. But have you stood on, next to him before? I have not stood next to him before, which is I said I need to stand next to him. But right now, where I stand in my life, I believe Kyler Murray is a five foot six man. Kyler Murray tells the women in his life that he's five ten. Oh yeah, I'm oh, sure. Oh man, I'm sure he does. I'm sure he, maybe he's got five eleven and a half. Maybe even that five eleven and a half to like sell himself a little bit. But We're not just firing shots; we are firing cannons over from Math Bomb over here. Moving on here to the last position of need for the Colts. We have the corners. Um, This will be the last segment before we let you guys on. Thanks for everybody tuning in and listening to this whole entire process. Um, Corner is a fun one because I think at the top, there's probably five to six names that I could see in almost any order for a lot of people. And I have seen them in almost any order for a lot of people. Uh, For me, I have Ahmad Gardner as corner one. Um, He's actually going to line up as a top five player on my big board um i'm a big gardner fan man i just think he's the most technically sound corner especially at the top of this class i think he's going to come in day one be able to play without much coaching um also got to be the most confident player in this entire class just a guy who believes in his own abilities he was only at cincinnati so people are going to knock him for that but he saw elite talent at times and we saw him at the alabama game that game didn't go well for cincinnati in many lights um but anybody ahmad gardner was on did not produce in that game for alabama and that's a big tell for me is seeing what he was able to do against that type of talent ahmad gardner is my corner one so corner two um you'll see that i'm just very into the technical aspect of corner. Um, I really like Andrew Booth Jr.'s game out of Clemson. Um, I think he has that athletic skill that you're going to like as well. I know some people who have met one because um, of some of the athletic abilities they see in him and that they think he's maybe going to be a little bit more athletic at the next level even. Um, I have him at two. So at three, Again, some people have this guy at one, but I have Derek Stingley Jr. at three. The injury concerns make him fall a little bit for me, um, not being on the field. Corners are just one of those spots that the hamstring issues come up a lot for corners. I'm just really concerned on if he's going to be able to stay out there and stay healthy. Um, When he's on the field, electric player able just to take guys away, a guy who can make a lot of plays at the next level, ball hawk type corner. Now it's just, can he stay on the field? At four for me, I have Trent McDuffie from Washington. Um, Really good athlete. I love his lateral ability to move laterally. And he's a very aggressive tackler. If you if you love those kind of players on, at the corner position, you're, you'll like Trent McDuffie. I think he's a guy that's just willing to put it all on the line to make tackles. And he still tackles the right way. You don't have to worry about him leading with his helmet because there are some of those guys on tape, trust me. Um, so I have Trent McDuffie at four. So Trent McDuffie isn't Sean Davis 2.0. Yeah, Sean Davis last year was a walking helmet-to-helmet hit um, at safety that the Colts drafted out of Florida. But speaking of Florida, coming in at corner five for me, um, I have Kahir Elam out of Florida. Um, I have talked to a scout in the NFL who even has this guy as their corner one. Like I said, I just think these top five guys, top six guys can go in almost any realm. Um, I think Elam is a guy 
Um, he's a, he's been a multi-sport athlete his entire life. Um, he's a guy who has played baseball, played football, played track. The part that NFL teams are really going to like is that he played track. Um, you have you have that speed that you're going to want on the outside. Um, his father was a college safety um, in Indiana, even at Notre Dame. Um, oh. So he's just a guy who's been around the game his entire life, um, has the speed that you're going to want at corner, very technically sound even. I like him at five. Real quick, real quick, real quick. It's ran track, not played. Track. Yeah. So I said play the other sports, and it kind of just came out that way. <laughs> and I was just going to run through it like I ran track and just try to get past it. But nothing can get past you, old Michael. Um, up next at corner six, I have Kyler Gordon from Washington. Um, love his ability to make plays at the corner position. Super great athlete. Um, he's going to probably hear his name in the second. The reason I have him a little bit lower, he's a little bit smaller than a lot of these guys I've said at 5'11", um, which isn't ty- terrible for a corner, um, but he's 5'11". So coming in at corner seven for me, I have Tariq Woolen from UTSA. Um, so, I mean – I know my boy can't hear, has some San Antonio roots, uber athlete, loves to play with his hands, super aggressive at the line of scrimmage for a corner. There's going to be a team that falls in love with him. I wouldn't be shocked if he gets drafted a little bit higher than some people are even picturing for him. At number eight, I have Elante Taylor from Tennessee. Um, Similar reasoning that I'm going to be using, just an aggressive style corner. Only six foot, but plays bigger, in my opinion. He's able to go up and get the ball. He's he's able to play and contest those big-time throws, which is a nice thing to add in. Um, And then rounding up my top ten, Oh, this is number nine. I apologize. Number nine, Roger McCreary from Auburn. Um, I guess the reason that came to me that had him a little bit lower than some, um, because I'm sure other people have him higher, is that I'm just not 100% sure if he's going to be able to come in day one. I think he's going to have a lot of coaching on his footwork for for one that I think is going to have to get worked out for him to be able to play right away. So that's going to be one aspect for him. And number 10, a guy I wish I could have higher because he's just one of my draft crushes, Zion McCollum, uber athlete. If you're a Colts fan listening, which is a Colts podcast, so you should be a Colts fan if you're listening, um, aced the draft aspect as an athlete, just murdered the agility drills, but then went farther than that, the, the broad jump drills. He, <laughs> Zion McCollum is a freak. That's all there is to say. Um, I've, I've even heard of a team that likes him more at safety. So I'm really curious to see if other teams see that big body for a corner, six, four, one ninety. Um, I love Zion McCollum. I think he's going to hear his name earlier than some people. Um, early day three is what I'm seeing from most people. When they look at the prediction predictions for him, I could see him sliding in at the end of the day too, just because of how freaky he is. Boo, Noah Caleb Evans, boo. So it makes you feel better. He is 11. Should have been 10. <laughs> uh, our top fives weren't super different. Um, so we don't have a whole lot of differences there. Sauce Gardner's number one easily. Um, I've been I've been banging that drum since very early in the draft process that Ahmad Gardner is CB1. And people were telling me, no, Derek Stingley, Kyer Elam, Andrew Booth. It's always been Gardner. And I'm, I'm glad that people are catching hey, up. I'm with you, Kent. I'm with <laughs> you. Guy, I've been arguing with people for months. The guy has never allowed, allowed a touchdown in, in college football. And he just he just doesn't lose, man. I actually read a great quote on him, which was, and I'm paraphrasing because I don't have a quote in front of me, but essentially when they, when they were asking about whether or not what they thought about Gardner, and they said, we don't know because we just don't go that way. We, we put some scrub on him and let that guy – waste his time we just we just threw elsewhere and it's like that level of respect don't happen like to the point where you're just like let's not even game plan let's just put someone else over there that we don't care that much about and we'll we'll go over here we'll do that stuff um that says a lot about how good of a player he is he is a top five player in this class uh best cornerback out there um i also had booth as my second guy i love his athletic traits i love his length i love a lot of things the guy brings to the table he's able to do a lot of really good stuff as a corner um he projects well both in man and zone 
does a lot of a lot of the re- the the real simple stuff well, and he has the athletic traits to project even better when he gets in the NFL. Um, I had Elam as my number three. I've kind of waffled a bit between my three, um, my three and my four a little bit, but I I tend to I tend to come back to something, and I'll get to that when I get to the four. But it's just consistency. I think I think Elam has had a little bit more consistency in his career. Um, you know, he plays for Florida. He plays faces top end of talent all the time. He does well most of the time. Um, there's there's a couple of times where he gets a little over eager. Uh, part of that is just the scheme that Florida runs. Part of that is just the type of player that he is. And you can coach that out if you want to be a little bit more cautious, or you can use it and just deal with it um, and deal with the fact that sometimes he's going to get beat, but he's going to make some plays otherwise. Um, four for me is Stingley. Um, I worry a lot about guys with injury concerns and Stingley's best season was phenomenal. Easily the best individual season of any cornerback in this class, even Gardner. Um, But that was three seasons ago. And since that time, he hasn't had a single interception. Um, I I did, I did something on, on Gardner. I think Gardner had three or four interceptions against ranked opponents over that period of time. And Stingley had none. Um, interceptions aren't the only thing though. It's not the only thing you can gauge a guy on, but Stingley hasn't been healthy long enough for us to really get a good gauge on where he is as a player. And there's a point where nostalgia needs to kind of be looked past, especially in the draft process. And the, the fact that Stingley is sitting here at four and could go very high in the draft, despite only really having one great season tells you how great that season was and how good of a player he was in that season. Uh, My number five is Trent McDuffie. Um, You kind of already, already talked up about, about McDuffie a little bit. There isn't really anything I can add to him as a player. He's got all the athletic traits, um, doesn't really have the length um, and his, he's a little on the smaller side, but he's fast. He's explosive. Those are the types of things you want from your quarterback. Uh, My number six is a guy. I just, I just, I, I like him a lot more than I should have. Uh, and I'm, I struggle to try to rank him because he just doesn't project well, which is Roger McCreary. Um, he's not very lengthy at all. Um, it doesn't show up on tape as much as uh, they usually when you have a guy that has length problems, it shows up on tape a lot. They, they struggle when the ball is out they're, they're They get beat by guys who are able to box them out on the outside and able to do those quick moves. Um, they lose at jump balls because they just lack the length. You don't see that a lot with Roger McCreary, but this is about projecting him to the NFL. And he didn't test well at all. Um, I think he tested just, just barely above average for Raz. None of his metrics were in elite range except the bench and who cares for a corner. Um, he's a very physical guy, very confident, really like what he brings to the table from an attitude standpoint physically just not there for what you want um, a high rank guy to be, which is the opposite of the next one, which is Tariq Woolen. Tariq Woolen is a fantastic athlete. Um, I know, I know some of the guys that trained him during the off season when he, his day came up in the draft and they were, we were talking about guys that run sub four, three, sub four, four, because of how rare it is as a trait. And they were telling me Woolen's got that every day in the week before the draft, every, every, every time he ran before he got ready for the draft was under four, three. Um, he has consistent speed at six, four, two Oh five. That is ridiculous in the NFL. Um, his change of direction drills weren't good, but everything else was good enough for that height, weight, weight, speed stuff that you can find a very easy spot for him in the NFL. Just put him on the biggest guy out there and erase him. Um, I love me some road runners. Um, I actually went to the first game ever for the UTSA road runners when I was down there. Um, love them. They're one of my teams. Um, so I've watched a lot of games from my road runners and Woolen pops on tape that athleticism pops. Um, there's going to be a little bit of a growing period when he gets to the NFL, but long-term that's, that's the type of projectable traits that you just, you just want your starters to have. Um, Kyler Gordon's my number eight. Um, He's a very, very good athlete. He ran a 396 shuttle and a 667 three cone, which is absurd. Um, that is that is ridiculous change of direction ability. Um, he's got about a little bit about a little bit above average height, not not great height. Um, 
He's got a, a decent build. He's a little bit a little bit stringier from a from a, a physical standpoint than you really want. He's got the the measurements, the metrics are there, but I'm not sure his frame is quite filled out how it needs to be to to really hold up in the NFL. Um, but he's got a, all the athletic traits that you need to to really really bring it to opposing defenses or offenses. Uh, Martin Emerson is my number nine out of Mississippi State. This is another guy who's got really good size, really good length. Um, his arms are five inches longer than Roger McCreary's, <laughs> which doesn't mean anything in the grand scheme of thing. I just think that's a funny comparison. Um, he didn't, he didn't do very well in the explosive explosion drills. He only had a 32 inch vert, which could be concerning, but, um, very feisty player on tape, uh, very good speed for his size, not a burner, but he's got good enough speed for his size. Um, probably starts out in a, a very physical press man type of defense and, and works him in from there. Um, and rounding out my top 10, and it's actually rounding out my top 10, because uh, I can count, <laughs> is Damari Mathis out of Pitt. Uh, Damari Mathis is a guy that's, that's a bit of a late riser. Um, I didn't get a chance to watch him earlier. I'm not, I'm not one of the early people on him. Uh, but I know somebody who was and has been talking about for some time. And when I finally did get around to watching him on tape, uh, he was right. He's a very, very good player. Um, another guy that's just about average size, just above average, not a, not a big lengthy guy, but he's got adequate size and length, extremely explosive at a 43 and a half inch for 11 foot, uh, one inch broad, uh, ran a four, three, nine. He's got those athletic traits that you want to put on your outside, uh, uh cornerback. Um, I'm sure there's going to be a growing period and we're kind of past the guys that can jump right in. Um, but from a, from a projectable standpoint, get him some work as a rookie, start working him in more, more and more year two by year three, you've got a productive starter. Something I feel like I need to say for Colts fans for Tariq, Tariq Woolen. Um, one of the play, one of the player cards I have for him, um, is Rocky sin who the Colts just traded, um, just because I see so much similarities in them personally, like when I watch them on tape. Um, I, I don't know how they compare athletically. I'm sure Tariq Woolen probably ups him athletically for sure, if I had to guess. So, but like on tape, I just see them, their, their hands, their hips. Um, they just move very similar, um, Lee, in my opinion. So that's one of the player comps I have for him, even though, again, I think he is a better athlete than Rock. Well, I think the injury scares for Derek Stingley are massive. Uh, you can't trust him. Can't trust his body. So therefore, this is this is coming from Michael's heart right now because so, uh, so, Stingley so has been like his son the last year and a half. Yeah. So therefore, he must drop all the way to number forty-two overall. He should come to the Colts just as a flyer. Just you know, just. A flyer, just, just and draft him. Around. Yeah, just, just just draft him. Maybe he works out. Who knows? Couple All Pro seasons get you a Super Bowl and becomes a Hall of Famer. Who knows? Uh, maybe just little stuff like that. But uh, the 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 argument or the debate between one and two, and I honestly I think one and two is literally just Gardner and Stingley. I don't think Booth or Elam or McDuffie touches those one two for me. It, it, it really is 1A and 1B for me. And I will say Stingley is my number one. I love both of these guys, but I've loved Stingley much, much longer. He did not play in the 2020 season, um, you know, for the COVID reasons and everything, which is weird because then he came back more injured than he did when he set out that year. So that was pretty weird to me. Uh, but Still, like Kent said, that one year, his freshman year, he was locking dudes down. No one could get anything on him. He played Alabama. He played Texas A&M. He played Ole Miss. He played even in the national championship game. He played Justin Ross, T. Higgins. They couldn't get anything on him. Nada. And if that was in 2021, man, I would agree with you. I, for, I, I, right, right. I, I guess to me, when it comes to it, I mean, again, I have Booth at two, um, so not even Stingley at two. Right. I, I, just, I haven't heard a good enough argument. So, like, for Gardner and Booth, they're both top ten uh, players on my big board. Um, 
so I get that they're kind of close. I just haven't heard an argument that could make it to where I could even take a 1A, 1B situation. Um, I think Gardner on film, Gardner the person, Gardner the athlete. I've just seen step by step by step. I just feel like my corner one has been affirmed in every direction. That I, I just – I don't know. For usual positions, I get arguments, and I'll take them, and I'll <laughs> consider them. For corner in this class, that's just not one of them for me, man. <laughs> Ahmad Gardner has been my corner one since the beginning. I mean, I told you last year going into last the yeah. season, yeah, Michael, that I thought Gardner was corner one for me. Um, and as the season went on, it just got better. Um, and for me, through the draft process, it just locked it in. I, I, there's just no changing me off Gardner. And I don't mean that disrespectfully. Um, it's just where I've gotten in terms of the prospect. Hey, guys, like I said, this year on this argument – or not really even an argument, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I, I, there's nothing bad I have to say about a mod Gardner. I think when it just comes to eye test for me, athleticism and all that stuff, and of course that freshman year might as well have been 10 years ago because it's already almost irrelevant. But I got to assume he's still young. His body is going to recover. If it just completely breaks down, I really feel sorry for whoever drafts him. But alone i i still would just lean sting, stingly but it's not something that i would passionately debate like there were some last year like the zaven collins the terrence marshalls of the world you know that were that i was passionate about debating this one would be like okay i agree with you like that that would be it i mean there there is no debating too much on who's right or who's wrong because both of these guys are good they're definitely worthy of being corner one. Now, me personally, again, let's just trade up and get one of them. I don't care. Uh, wide receiver can take care of itself. I just want to lock down corner so we can stop. St- stop. So we're not, we're not talking, I want we're not to, I want to stop some, I want to stop someone in the fourth quarter for once. Okay. Can't, can't, I'm sorry. You're having to hear us <laughs> argue right now. We're not talking about trading up for a corner. We're, we're just not doing that right now. I'm sorry. Not, not, not allowing it. Um, and again, I understand that you're saying, um, there's not a right or wrong here. I just disagree. I'm on a card. <laughs> it can't, if it makes you feel any better, man, uh, I am running franchise right now. I'm about to go into the 2023 season and your lions actually did some cool stuff. They got a Mark Gardner and got Garrett Wilson. Love it. And just so you know, because I, I didn't post it earlier today, but I think Stingley's Raz is at 9.17 right now, unofficially. Mm. That, that, that's pretty good, I guess. That, that, that's, that that's higher than my 2.24 or whatever it is. Yeah, just a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I say Stingley, Stingley uh, he, he gets past me, I guess. I'll allow Stingley it. Stingley did a lot to get past Destin, guys. He had to train for two years. To get past Destin, guys. Uh, Kent Lee Platty via Math Bomb on Twitter, guys, joined us today for the Blue Stable. Now, once again, uh, Kent, I'm about to give you the floor to plug any and everything that you possibly can uh, for for your stuff, man. Go for it. Yeah, like you mentioned, you can find me on Twitter at Math Bomb. I spend most of my time on there just trying to talk about football uh, and math and analytics and movies and all other kinds of random crap but i i enjoy getting on there and talking about football so if you have any questions about any of this stuff do you want to know more about raz or you just want to know more about analytics or coding or how you get into this type of stuff hit me up jump jump on and talk to me man that's what that's what we're out there for it's it's meant to be accessible um you can always check me out on my website which is ras.football try to make it nice and easy to remember so raz.football um, you can go there and look up any player from uh, 1987 all the way to the player's draft year. So 36 years, I think it is now. Um, you can also check out the mock draft simulator at profootballnetwork.com. I run that. I'm the, the curator for that system. I do all the coding and stuff behind the scenes there. So check that out. Um, and just in general, enjoy the draft and, and don't be one of those people who yells at a player for not being another player. Um, the, the draft is great, man. We've, we've got, there's actually a, a good four days of the draft. You guys might know, which is day one, for the first round day two, which is rounds two and three day three, which is the last rounds. And then day four, which is the talking yourself into the picks day where you try to convince yourself that your team knows what they're doing. 
and every pick is fantastic. And overreacting um, to every single yeah. Yeah. Told you. Yeah. Th- 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 this guy's gonna be a pro bowler. This guy's had got a potential to be oh. Hall of Fame and 260 Pro Bowlers, man. It's great. It's <laughs> amazing, go. incredible. Um, but just enjoy the draft and and try to stay up on it and and support support people that are, are covering the sport for you because that's what helps make this stuff fun. There you go, guys. And all that stuff that he mentioned, you know, his Twitter, the website, all of that is going to be in the description below. We're going to put the links down there for you guys. That way it's just easy because you probably already forgot it already. I probably did already the, the website. I think it was ras.com. Oh. No, f- f- football. <laughs> so so yeah, he really be, forgot. He it's really going to be it's going to be down in the description below, guys. OK, so once again, uh, this is the Blue Stable podcast uh the official Colts podcast of fan side of guys if you haven't already thank you uh first off thank you for even staying this long through the episode but if you haven't already make sure you smash that subscribe button make sure you hit the like button comment down below what you thought about these rankings uh is Destin wrong for thinking Ahmad Gardner is cornerback one is it Andrew Booth is it Derek Stingley uh and also if y'all want to tell him to never mention Michael McFadden again we would appreciate that as, as well. All right, guys. So once again, he is Kent Lee Platty. He is Destin Adams. I am Michael Pevia. Make sure you check us out on Twitter at thebluestable.com, website, Twitter, whatever the case may be, guys. We'll be back at it with you again next week and maybe some new Colts news, guys. But again, calm down. It was just a guard. See you next week. <laughs>